Welcome to the online narrated lectures for CM2101. This week we will begin our discussion of rotational spectroscopy. The reason why we start with rotational spectroscopy is because it is the simplest to understand. In discussing rotational spectroscopy, we do not need to worry about concomitant vibrational and electronic transitions. Rotational transitions occur at much lower energies than that required for vibrational or electronic. So vibrational and electronic transitions will not be excited at the same time as rotational transitions. We will look at the specific setup for a microwave absorption instrument. Remember that the radiation normally associated with transitions between rotational energy levels is in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. For this reason, rotational spectroscopy is also frequently referred to as microwave spectroscopy. The simplest molecule to discuss in rotational systems is a rigid diatomic, and so that is where we will start. In nature, many elements have more than one isotope. We will investigate how this will affect rotational spectroscopy. We will then relax the approximation that the molecule is rigid and see how this affects our solution. Polyatomic systems introduce additional complications and we will discuss some of these. Finally, we will report modern applications of rotational spectroscopy. In part one, we will look at the instrumentation involved and some of the observations that we will need to explain. Before we look at the instrumentations and observations though, you may have asked yourself why should electromagnetic radiation affect the rotation of a molecule? Now to be fair, the answer lies in some fairly esoteric quantum calculations, but we can appreciate it using classical physics. Remember that electromagnetic radiation is comprised of an electric field and a magnetic field propagating at right angles to one another. Well, if we place a molecule, say a heteronuclear diatomic, that is one that has a permanent dipole moment, we can see what will happen. The electric field will exert a force on the positive end of the molecule in the opposite direction to the force it will exert on the negative end of the molecule. This will exert a torque or turning force on the molecule. As the electromagnetic radiation passes over the molecule, we can imagine that the molecule could be forced to rotate at some frequency. Although this explanation is flawed, it does give you an idea of how light and matter can interact and manifest itself in changes in rotation. In particular, this simple model implies that electromagnetic radiation will excite the rotational levels of a molecule provided it has an electric dipole moment. It can do this because the electromagnetic field can then exert a torque on the molecule. For microwave and radio frequency radiation, we have tunable monochromatic sources. A common microwave source is a clistron, although many modern instruments employ solid state devices. The clistron still has an advantage over more modern solid state sources in that they can produce far higher microwave power output. The problem with the clistron though is that it is a pain to operate and can be quite dangerous. For instance, if you fitted a tube that was too narrow, then the microwave radiation would not be able to propagate, and in fact the microwave radiation would be reflected back into this clistron and destroy it. It has to be said that rotational spectroscopy is not very popular today, but this might be changing. A few years ago, someone managed to improve upon an old design for a Fourier transform microwave spectrometer. This would make this spectroscopy a lot easier and faster to conduct, so we will see. The microwave radiation is sent down a hollow tube made out of copper or silver. The inside of the tube is sometimes coated with gold. This tube acts as a waveguide. You have probably seen an optical fibre down which we can send visible light. The optical fibre is also acting as a waveguide it prevents loss of radiation along the path. The central section of the tube 
is separated from the rest of the instrument by mica windows. Mica is a silicate mineral that forms wonderful laminar sheets. It is useful for us in constructing this instrument because mica is transparent to microwave radiation. The central section can then be evacuated using a vacuum pump and the sample can then be introduced as a gas at low pressure. The detector is simply a radio receiver or crystal detector. We can then pass microwave radiation from 0.1 to 100 wave numbers through our sample and collect our spectrum. Well, let's suppose that we introduce a diatomic gas. Let's say dioxygen, that is O2, or carbon monoxide, what will we observe? Well, for dioxygen, we see no spectral lines. But for carbon monoxide, we do see spectral lines. Does this mean that dioxygen molecules do not rotate? No, dioxygen molecules are rotating, and indeed, dioxygen molecules are constantly changing rotational energies through collisions. These observations are telling us that microwave radiation can be used to change the rotational state of carbon monoxide molecules, but not dioxygen molecules. Here is a typical spectrum that we might record for carbon monoxide. This figure comes from Hollis's modern spectroscopy. What features do you notice? Well, I hope that the first thing is that the spectral lines appear to be evenly separated. I should also point out here that we are measuring transmission and not absorbance. So when the transmission is small, it means that the sample is doing a lot of absorbing. There is one other feature that is apparent. There appear to be a second set of lines at much smaller intensities, which are slightly closer together. This is not noise. For one thing, it is occurring periodically. What is this due to? In fact, it is due to the presence of carbon-13 monoxide, which amounts to approximately 1.3% of all the carbon present. In a sense, we have two overlapping spectra here, one due to carbon-12 monoxide and one due to carbon-13 monoxide. The ratio of the intensities is in fact one of the ways we know the relative abundances of isotopes. This is confirmed by the following table. The lines are approximately 3.85 wave numbers apart. Note that this table records lines earlier in the spectrum than those seen in the spectrum on the previous slide. On the previous slide, the first line seen in the spectrum is a line at 15.38 wave numbers. This is simply due to the range chosen to be presented and not because the data wasn't available. The spectrum also shows only a slight change in relative intensity over the spectral range measured. I want to stress one further point. Rotational spectroscopy can be very accurate. The numbers in this table are being reported to seven significant figures. This is because they are accurate to a very high fidelity. The information that we can glean from this data will also be very accurate because of this. One of the reasons why this spectrum has so little broadening is because the spectrum was recorded at some 40 to 50 Kelvin. This was not done in the laboratory, but instead is from the star-forming regions of an interstellar dust cloud. We use microwave spectroscopy to identify molecules in space all the time. In fact, one of the more interesting molecules recently identified in an interstellar dust cloud was ethyl alcohol, the alcohol found in beer. In fact, it was estimated that the amount of alcohol in the interstellar dust cloud was enough to make 400 trillion trillion glasses of beer. Other interesting molecules we have seen in interstellar dust clouds are amino acids, the very building blocks of life. So we have three observations to account for. First, there is no rotational spectrum for dioxygen, a homonuclear diatomic. Second, there is a rotational spectrum for carbon monoxide, a heteronuclear diatomic. And third, the spectrum consists of evenly spaced lines with only slight changes in relative intensities. 
How can we account for these observations? To account for these observations, we need to solve the Schrodinger equation. Fortunately, I do not go into any real detail about the solution, but I do want to guide you through how it is done. We will be concentrating on the solutions. And to do this, we need the Hamiltonian for a rotating system. You may remember from high school that rotational energies were related to rotational speeds and moments of inertia. I want to spend a little bit of time going over moments of inertia. What is it, you may ask? Well, it is simply the resistance of a rotating body to a change in its rotational energy. It is directly analogous to mass in linear motion. Mass represents the resistance of a linear moving body to a change in its linear motion. We will see that this analogy will help us construct the Hamiltonian for a rotating system. This is the end of part one of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part two.